Yeah, the surveyor's rendezvous are fun to learn how uh, surveyors from all over the United States and even uh, overseas survey. Um, Texas, I mean, we know we're special and all, but Texas surveyors are actually very different. Uh, the way the land works, the land grants, the Mexican land grants, all of that system is, um, is different than the surveyors that do sections and townships and ranges and all of the public lands. and. Uh, so it's very interesting to go study that around the different parts of the country. Uh, we're actually, I'm hoping to go in September up to Concord, Massachusetts, uh, studying Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond. People think he was an author and got famous doing that, but he was a surveyor for his whole career and, and surveyed most all the land around Concord. And you can go up there and look at all his field books and surveying instruments and things at the library. So our group's gonna go study that and put a, a new, uh, marker uh, on his grave uh, at the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery up there. Um, but yeah, today I'm here to talk uh, about the El Camino Real and Catherine showed me that she had just gotten a new issue of the Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine and I subscribed so apparently this is brand new because I haven't received mine in the mailbox yet. It's got a, about a three page article on the El Camino Real Association, I mean El Camino Real National Historic Trail uh, and it's most of this came from uh, the director of the association that I'm vice president of. Our one paid employee, Stephen Gonzalez, uh, works full time as trying to promote and handle and be a liaison between the National Park Service who funds the organization um, and, and doing all the public work. So he put together the article for Texas Parks and they've also just recently filmed for the Texas Parks and Wildlife TV show some of, about the El Camino Real. So um, let me set that back to, well, put it here. Um, and what I've got, you notice Stephen up here instead of Henry Mayo, I didn't want to take credit away from him for sending me his PowerPoint. And I combined my own PowerPoint uh, after the general El Camino Real information part that he did. Mm -hmm. So um, well, we'll talk about what an El Camino Real, I mean, uh, I grew up here and Old San Antonio Road is just synonymous with El Camino Real. If you go along, especially Brazos County, it's exactly the same trail that was marked by the DAR. And um, are we needing microphone? Okay, it, it was marked by the DAR in um, 1918 with markers every five miles all along. And you think, why does the DAR, the Daughters of American Revolution, marking a Texas trail? But it's actually a national trail. It went from Louisiana to Mexico. And so they were very instrumental in getting those markers put in every five miles along there in 1918. And uh, 10 years ago or so, they actually went back to the inventory and find the missing ones that had gotten taken out with the construction or whatever and, and, and tried to recover whatever they could. But the El Camino Real de los Tejas, uh, El Camino Real of, the, of Texas, of the Tejas area, of the Indians, um, is what we're talking about today. And it, it starts in uh, Louisiana at the Los Adios, uh, right on the Louisiana border. It, it was a, a Indian colony that the Spanish put a mission in there in uh, the 1600s. And so they started traveling between Mexico City and Los Adios up there east of Nacogdoches. And, um, and the Indian tribe is still, the descendants are still around. Actually one of the, the chiefs who's an engineer in Houston, but he was on our board uh, up until last year. He had uh, termed out uh, Chief uh, Davis, and, uh, but he's the chief of the Los Ad the, the Adios Indians in Louisiana. And the trail, this is at that end of it, um, just telling that it's the royal road of the Spanish government to their colonies. I mean, we were New Spain, uh, what Texas and New Mexico, Arizona all came out of Spain. So uh, historically, the uh, Camino Reales were connecting the economically important Spanish towns and provinces, mines uh, of, of, of the Mexican, I mean of the Spanish government uh, based in Mexico, the New Spain. The trails, there's, there's actually three main Camino Reales. One uh, that comes from San Francisco down to Mexico City is if you go to California, you'll see signs, National Trail, El Camino Real. Mm -hmm. It's a different trail. They merge when they get down to Zacatecas in central Mexico. Uh, then there's the 
uh, one in West Texas goes through El Paso up to Santa Fe that comes down and merges in at Durango. So those are the three uh, old Spanish El Camino Reals. And luckily, we have a lot of records of when and diaries and, and the missionaries and the uh, explorers of the Spanish kept diaries since the 1690s on traveling along the El Camino Reals. So it was really good that uh, we have the documentation. And the reason that the Spanish started really coming in uh, was because the French came in and sort of got in Spanish territory and they knew about it, that they, LaSalle had come over from France and was landing on the Gulf Coast in, you know, in Spain. And, and they didn't like you know, a Frenchman starting to set up shop in, in their territory, so they went to looking for him. So they sent De Leon out from Mexico up to find where the, where the French village was on the coast. And it uh, took him about three years to get up and find the remains of Fort St. Louis. Um, and so starting in 1686, they started sending expeditions. And then in, uh, uh, De Leon came in in 1686, 7, 8, and then 9. He finally gets to Fort St. Louis. That's where they found the LaBelle there at Matagorda Bay Area um, 20 years ago or so. LaSalle ship that's in the, the uh, Bullock Center now. But so De Leon was just trying to find the French village and when he found it, all he found was the abandoned fort and uh, most of the uh, LaSalle had already gone. He had ended up over here in, in part of his expedition, it met his demise. But um, so that's the reason they were really trying to do it in the 1689, 1691. But then the missionaries, they just, you know, the, the Catholic government, the Spain was Catholic, so their religion was charged with, you know, a, a civilizing or being missionaries to the uncivilized uh, new natives over here. So they were sending missionaries up the El Camino Real from Mexico to uh, set up all the way up to the Louisiana border. And those, they kept diaries of that also. In 1690, it talks about uh, De Leon and they, Goliad was part of the trail. So it went through San Antonio, but it also branched over to, to Goliad. Um, you'll see on those maps I've passed out, there's the National Historic the National Park Service map is the black banded one that, that's the newest maps and um, then there's several, uh, I didn't bring quite as many copies of the ones from the Trail Association, They were it's a little bit older map, but you can see it's not a single trail and you think well how does the El Camino Real not a single trail, but if you were traveling 2,000 miles across Texas in the 1600s, not only do you not know where the last people traveled, you would travel at different times for different reasons. The weather, where, where you crossed creeks, it depends on if it was summer or winter, if they were flooded or not. If there was, if you were afraid of Indians or you had heard that Indians were in a certain area, you wouldn't want to stay out in the prairie. You would stay in the wooded area when you went through that part. So the trail purposely, uh, or, or just naturally, branched into several locations. And then also, it sometimes they were needing to go to a different mission to Goliad instead of San Antonio so they would branch off and go a little different route. So what's been deemed the National Historic Trail by the federal government thanks to Kay Bailey Hutchison in 2004 is actually all of these trails and uh, in Brazos County we're fortunate in one way and, and I guess we get cheated a little in the other by only having one one branch of it is the highway OSR along the north end of the county. Most of the other counties have branched off sections, but um, it really helps out when we're trying to like put signs on the trail to only have the one to deal with. And, and Milam County had to put dozens of signs out all along, a big expense to, to get all that out. Um, but the expeditions to East Texas, um, they set up these missions, uh, San Francisco de los Tejas mission uh, in 1690. and. Um, 1700, they started, let's see, foundation of the mission. Uh, 1717 was the Alamo, uh, or 1718 actually, foundation of uh, De La Vea de San Fernando de Bejar, Mission San Antonio de Valero is the Alamo. And this, those were all set up right there in the same time period, within a year or so of each other. Um, and so the El Camino Real was connecting all this, uh, is it, to bring in supplies, bring in army, bring in um, 
uh, more Catholic goods to the churches, uh, relics, uh, building materials, and um, and then 1820, you know, skip ahead 100 years, the missions like the Alamo was already in ruins. I mean, it was 100 years old already by the time the Texans, the Anglos started coming. And so then we, but they were still using the El Camino Real, the, the old San Antonio Road and, and the branches of the El Camino Real uh, to travel on. And, and Stephen Austin's land grant actually used that as the northern boundary. They used the Gulf up to the old San Antonio Road. Uh, as the boundary of his land grant. So it was a well-established uh, trail across Texas. And again, it's even Brazos County, the early maps, you'll see where the, there's two or three crossings of the trail on the Brazos. So it's not a fixed location um, where the trail was in 1840 when the county line, or 1820 when Stephen Austin's grant was done. They just said it uses the old San Antonio Road as the north boundary, and they didn't define where on the Brazos River that crossed at. But then, yeah, the, the present time is in 2004, the federal government, after starting in 1991, actually, the state of Texas started working on getting this established as a National Historic Trail. There's others in the US, United States, but not through Texas, other than the one small section in El Paso had a National Historic Trail. and. Um, so it was just, you know, needed to be done, and, and TxDOT helped fund some of the research into all the old diaries so they could really pinpoint and prove out that this was used by the Spanish and, and the missionaries in the 1600s. 1915, this goes back to when the, when the Daughters of the American Revolution were putting out their stones every five miles on here. Um, in 1915, all of that happened. 1918, the markers went up, and they did choose just one route, which causes a little bit of an issue with when we have the map now and the National Historic Trail has several routes, uh, sometimes a few hundred miles north-south from each other. Um, people say, well, that's not the one that has the markers on it. Well, the DAR couldn't mark all of those anyway, but if you read the survey uh, from Mr. Zivley in 1915, 1916, he said he had to, you know, he was charged with choosing a route and so he had to choose which was the one that was the most uh, trans, the one that you could travel on the most uh, without crossing private properties and creeks that don't have bridges, and also which one was probably the one used the most. And so that's, they did choose one for the markers, but all the well knowing even 100 years ago that there wasn't just a single defined trail. And a lot of that still is on private property. Um, the trail they marked. It goes through private ranches that, that is not public accessible. Uh, 1929, um, they started, they created Highway OSR. It's the only state highway that doesn't have a number. It's actually called Highway OSR on, on TxDOT's designation. And they started working at paving and making it a connected travel way across Texas. And uh, the portions in Brazos County, uh, from the Navasota River, actually from Normandy over to Benchley to Highway 6. That all got built up and paved, paved into Highway OSR in 1935. And then from Benchley going on west to connect to Highway 21, that it, had, it didn't really connect very well over there. It, had, it was a lot of old county roads that zigzagged around. So it, it took them about five more years. In 1940, they, they created the Highway OSR west of Benchley over to Highway 21. And, um, but by 1949, most of the road was paved from, from San Antonio to Nacogdoches, and you could travel down OSR, and, and that's how it, it still is today. They've maintained that as a, as a highway. And then, they, like I mentioned, in 1991, the Texas legislators started working at preserving and, and documenting this in hopes that they could get the federal government to, to get the National Park Service involved. And that's a little bit of an effort also because the National Park Service mainly deals in public lands and public, um, Texas is a different animal when it comes to who owns the lands and the creek beds and things. And so uh, they couldn't, the National Park Service doesn't like to fund a lot of work when they can't control what's happening next to it. If there's private property on the fence lines instead of public lands, then they can't stop somebody from building, you know, 
uh, cell towers and oil wells and everything uh, right against the, the trail. And so they were a little reluctant at doing much for a National Historic Trail. But it proved out that it was very historic and, and we had the documentation from the 1600s. And um, so by uh, 2004, October 18th, 2004, it was designated as the, from the federal government as, a, as the newest National Historic Trail. Uh, and it's part of the National Historic Trail system, which started in 1968 uh, across the United States. They have National Historic Trails, you've got scenic trails, and then you've got um, the tourist routes. So there's a, uh, it's part of that system. But you can see on the map, it's actually I bought a pointer today. Um, yeah, Texas, it's the only one in the whole bottom end. I mean, before we got this in 2004, there was a big void that had nothing in the national trail system. So uh, that's why you know we don't see National Park Service rangers driving around like you do when you go to most other states. You're always close to something that's got National Park Service people. And, and so now in Texas, we actually have, have them come through pretty often. And, and they come to our meetings for the Trail Association and, and are really involved. Um, and the signs for the National Historic Trails, they always use the little, I don't know what, what's the term for the bubbled triangle sign, but it's their, their emblem that they use and, and uh, easily recognizable on, uh, on the sign. So for the El Camino Real, they came up with the mission and the Indian lady in front of the mission uh, silhouetted there. And so um, the, the El Camino Real Association, National Historic Trail Association, we're a nonprofit volunteer group. The National Park Service didn't create us, but they actually, once we created ourselves, and I wasn't involved in that in, in uh, 2006 or so, but then the National Park Service said, now that you are officially the uh, caretakers and, and uh, the group to, to handle getting signage and things with us, they wanted people on the ground to do their footwork with the county commissioners locally and things, and so that's what the association does. And they fund us to the tune of about $55,000 a year. And we have one paid staff member, and then we use up about 20000 a year or fifteen to put signs up in about three counties a year along the trail we work. And so we got Brazos County to, to get in on board, and they had to pay about four or 5000 for the installation of the signs. Uh, the National Park Service through the Trail Association paid for the manufacture of the signs that we needed. And they, they were put up earlier this year. I'll show later in the next section. But uh, that's what we have out there on the ground. So when you drive on Highway OSR and out through Bryan from, from the Navasota River, this side of Norman G over to Highway 21, you'll see, see the signs on the highway. Um, and we're, like I say, we're the, Brian's right here, so we just have a single section right in here. Robertson County has two or three sections, goes through it. They share our OSR boundary, but then they have one goes through the city of Franklin and one, one a little north of that. Um, and along the trail, starting down at the, the Mexican end at Laredo, and it actually goes over into Mexico, we just don't handle that, but in, in there's trail segments. and. There has been meetings between Mexican government. They they have a National Park Service similar organization, and they had a meeting less than a year ago in Laredo with the National Park Service and the Trail Association about what we can do to, to keep tourism, even though it's not really good uh, times right now for transit tourism into Mexico. It is being planned, and, and so it's a continuous thing that we can eventually get back to. Um, but this is uh, one of the ranches down in Mexico, or down on Laredo, at the, on the banks of the Rio Grande. And, and these are, there's actually one, I've, I went into one of these ranch buildings. It's uh, the oldest continuously used ranch building in the state of Texas, built in early 1700s on the El Camino Real. Adobe building with cedar wood beams and things, and it's still been used in, um, in uh, pretty good condition, right on the banks of the Rio Grande. And then it goes through San Antonio, it goes through Goliad, it goes through all the missions of the San Antonio area. The trail connected all of those up. So if you go into San Antonio and tour the missions, you'll be on a lot of the segments of the El Camino Real. Um, then it goes on over to, yeah, like I say, Goliad and La Bahia. Uh, and then over into East Texas, Mission Tejas. Uh, the actual mission, they've done excavations and found 
what they think is the site of the mission within you know a quarter mile, and they've got a museum and, and uh, recreated buildings over there. Um, and then at Nacogdoches, uh, you've got things like the old stone fort. It's recreated now on the SFA campus, but it was an old stagecoach stop and store uh, used in the early Republic of Texas periods on the El Camino Real. Uh, some of the most prominent places to see the trail, literally that see the trail, is at river crossings and uh, some of these swales. I know the photos are hard to see here, but this is, you know, it's, they call them ruts or swales. It's just eroded trail segments in the woods usually now. Some of them are in the prairies and then some of them cross the rivers, but it's just where 300 years of wagons and, and livestock has been marched through. And a lot of times you'll find two or three of them parallel to each other because they just got too muddy. And even maybe the same wagon train had to move over two times during between the front and the end of the wagon train because it just got so muddy that they had parallel trails in some of the soft ground areas or the river crossings. So you'll find them parallel. And you know that's not from nature. You know, it's not just erosion that caused these parallel trails. And nowadays with aerial photography, Google Earth, uh, LiDAR, all of this scanning, you can find definitely a lot of these things that you can't see just walking around and know what know how they connect several miles away from where you're standing that they're actually still going along. And this is a photo from 2013. It's the first sign we had put up on the El Camino Real. Apache Pass is in Milam County at a river crossing of the trail near where one of the Spanish missions was, uh, just west of Rockdale. And, uh, the owner of Apache Pass, is, he's got a store and a, and a little public park, or, or it's a private park, but he uses it for public events, have lots of festivals there. And the owner of the restaurant and, and the RV park there that named it Apache Pass, he, he was really a big supporter of the Trail Association. Uh, we've had Kay Bailey Hutchison there uh, actually dedicate this first sign when, when it was put up in 2013. And uh, this is some of the members of the association. Um, Steven Gonzalez here is our director. He's the uh, one that put together uh, the slideshow you just saw. Now I'm going to go into the next part, which is one I've done previous for people, about the Brazos County segments of the trail. What's, you know, what we have right here and how I got involved with this. This is just a 1940 aerial photograph of the, the Navasota River area in, in Highway OSR. And, um, the Highway OSR had just been built in 1935, and so when this photo was taken in 1940, you can see a pretty straight trail right here. The Navasota River is just off the photo up here, and um, you see this old road right here, and this is only about 150 feet between the two, but this is real typical along this. How we, uh, TxDOT wasn't just going to follow every nook and cranny, twist and turn, and a lot of them had 90 degree corners in the old old OSR routes and a lot of them had been changed to follow property corners, go around properties. So they would come through and, and cut cleaner routes and, and curves and um, leave sections of the old road sort of abandoned uh, and not known about. And this one here is one that we have discovered out there in uh, the very northeast corner of Brazos County that we're sort of working on. Right now it's just like an old eroded trash pit that the locals have used for putting trash in for years and and uh, but it, it's one we found when we start looking and uh, this is the cover of the of the book uh, that um, the National Park Service put together which lists all of, all it, it's it had a lot of draft versions and then the final version they determined which sites along the trail that they had found out about were high potential to be developed and the National Park Service isn't really proactive about going out and developing them themselves. They want organizations like the Trail Association to find them, find local support, financial uh, donations, and they're not in a big hurry. You know, the National Park Service, this trail is going to be there for, as the National Historic Trail forever, like Natchez Trace and, and <laughs> a lot of Blue Ridge stuff. So. They're, the National Park Service isn't in a hurry. They're up to the locals to, you know, want to hurry up and get the signs up, want to hurry up and get the roadside parks built. So that's what we're sort of working on. And this, this book actually 
has Brazos County, has one of our sites in it, and it even mentions the other that I showed at the Navasota River. But the Rye, Loop, Rye School Loop Swale is a high potential site listed in the, in the National Park Service final version of the El Camino Real report. And it says that, that there is a pronounced swale and a, a pretty much proven a remnant of the, of the 18th century, early 19th century a road route of the El Camino Real. And even mentions, if you notice, Zebulon Pike, who was not a Spanish missionary, but he traveled the trail and kept a diary on it in 1807 and mentions going through uh, the north end of Brazos County, even though it wasn't even a county at that time. This is, you know, 13 years before Moses Austin even came to Texas. So, um, but that, that we're, we're listed as a high potential site. And I've been working slowly because I work full time as a surveyor, but I've been working slowly at getting this sort of dedicated uh, and preserved and maybe some funding for a, a roadside park. And what it'll end up being is just a place along the El Camino Real, along Highway OSR, up near Lake Bryan, that you can pull over. It'll have an asphalt, it'll have the interpretive signs. You can stand there, it's on a hilltop, and you'll be able to see maps and read about where you're standing in this history that I'm sort of giving today in some type of a condensed version. And you'll be able to look out over the Brazos River bottom for about two and a half miles and see over into Burleson County where Fort Tenochtitlan was, the Mexican fort across on the bluff, uh, across from where Mumford is now. And um, we're hoping to get a lot of the brush and the mesquite trees cleared away and put native grasses back in there like it would be if you were traveling in the 17th, I mean, 18th and 19th century along the El Camino Real. You would, you would see this and, and, and um, that's what we're working toward. And, and um, so here's, I'll show you the location of the, of the Rye Loop Swales. It's nothing really to go out to see today, even though there are some signs that show it. They just point into the brush. <laughs> but uh, downtown Bryan right here, uh, you can barely see it. That's the, the courthouse area, the downtown Bryan. And so if you go out Sandy Point Road, uh, eight miles out to Lake Bryan, and just where Highway OSR comes along behind the dam on Lake Bryan, is the old Rye School Road. It was a, it was a county school uh, named after the community of Rye, R-I-E, R-Y-E, which was named after uh, uh, Henry, I can't remember his first name. He, he was from an Irishman that lived out in that area that came, uh, one of the first Brazos County pioneers that came in there. Supposedly he grew rye to make his whiskey out of in that area, and so they named the area Rye. Here's just a blow up of the same thing. So Rye School Road and Rye Loop comes around. Uh, OSR, Highway OSR, if you drive it behind Lake Bryan, it crosses here. St. Joseph, if you drive through there right now, you see a big football field and baseball fields that belong to St. Joseph's School. It was donated to them. They're right there across the street. And the segment, the, the old piece of Rye Loop Swale that didn't get taken out when they paved OSR is right there. Um, and this just mentions, these are 1935 article out of the Eagle mentioning the Rye Club. It was just a, a local, like a 4-H group or something. And it says that they were, uh, I'll read it here so I can speak into the mic. Uh, A.D. Jackson, Chief of Publications at A&M Ag Experiment Station, was the speaker at the meeting Tuesday night. And he mentioned, among other things, the urge that in so much as the old San Antonio Road had not been opened up, signs should be put up directing traffic through the community next year to show the travelers the farming and homing improvements there. So here in 1935, they were working at marking, putting signs for the old San Antonio Road. They said, people don't realize it's here. It's right through our community out here in rural Brazos County. So it's taken us uh, 80 years to get those signs up. But uh, that's, that was, and then the next article, uh, 1940, it talks about the highway is doing this. I mentioned 1935, they paid from Normandy to Benchley, and then here they were in 1940 mentioning uh, highway department plans to open road from Benchley West and uh, the county was gonna pay to secure 100 feet of right of way and, um, and connect it up. And there was uh, parts of it that did not connect. Uh, there's actually no OSR, like Brian's right here today, and OSR is a paved highway here in the dotted lines. But back then, the old OSR road was just came in and teed into the Rye Road. This was a pretty large creek crossing that didn't have a good bridge, I guess, and so, there was no extension, so in 1940 they were actually having to purchase 
uh, right of way and, and, and create a road and put in culverts and things. So they actually decided instead of, for some reason, instead of going through Mr. Kopecki's land here, they went through a different location a little bit. This is only about 300 feet length of a football field between the old road and the new. But as soon as this got opened and paved in 1940, it actually preserved this for us to, to have it now for, and the area I'm talking about putting a roadside park is, is between these two. It's about seven acres of land and, it, and it, even though it's north of Bryan, it belongs to the city of College Station. And um, <laughs> I they, was looking at that yeah. on a, yeah, I thought, what owners it said? Yeah. It's, um, what it is is the, the good artesian water wells in, in Brazos County to get the good drinking water, the big wells that we have, they're all, been, they're all drilled and have been for the last 50 years north of OSR along that area is where they are. And so College Station and Bryan and Texas a and have whale fields out there. And so I was surveying this 400 acre piece. It has gravel pits that uh, they had mined gravel and and it, you, you could not use it for anything anymore. It had grown up with trees in the pits. And so College Station bought it from the gravel company in uh, 2006 or so. And we were surveying that. And, and I sort of discovered even the deeds for the, uh, the land showed that it, that it had OSR going through the land. And you know, driving down the highway, I had no idea that just over there 300 feet or 250 feet was the old road. But it's, um, you can even see here's, the 1940 text dot plans for building uh, OSR. And like I say, this is turned a little bit different angle, but this is west toward the Brazos River and east toward Benchley. Um, and here's Rice School Road, and the old route just came in and teed into Rice School. Well, this is the area we're talking about. That This section of road is still there in the, in the private property, which belongs to the College Station. And here's the highway going through. So that, it wasn't like it was unknown. I mean, 1940, it was clearly known that they were not going to put pave over the old route in this section. Um, so we were excited to see that it's well known. This is a, about a 2005 aerial photo, and you can barely see the old road bed. And if you're on the ground out there, you, it's, it's mostly grass and mesquite trees. Um, and you walk through there, and you can see what it is is just like a, an old road that was maintained by a county road grader, never was paid. It was, in, until 1940, it was a county road. And they probably had a gravel surface, had a, what's called a bar ditch on both sides of the road. And so when you walk through the mesquites, you know, they're growing all around, but you, you clearly see the hump and the two ditches, and then it goes back through this little section. And that's what I had found and thought, well, you know, that's neat. That's the old road before they moved it over in 1940. Well, in um, 2000, Nine, uh, it was early, like January. I know it was pretty cold that day. The National Park Service was on one of their their scouting missions. They had two two people out of the National Park Service out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, coming through Texas, and the National uh, the Texas Historic Commission were with them. And they we had told them, you know, please stop and let us know, and we'll show you our site up here at Rye Loop, where we found where Henry found this old trail in the woods surveying. And so we got them to stop there. And I think, man, it's neat to have National Park Service people out here looking at this. And, but it was you know, just an old county gravel road out in the field. And Jim Brousseth, the Texas Historic Commission architect, I mean, archeologist at the time, the one that discovered the LaBelle that did all the, or didn't discover, but he did all of the archeology span on it. He was there. And so he walked with me, he said, let's walk down and look at this. And, I sort of just told him, well, don't even bother, you know, it's just, you can see it, it just goes 300 feet, it looks the same, just an old gravel. He said, no, let's walk through there, I think it may be something else. And he just had a feeling that we'd find something else, and, and he kept showing me down in the brush, down the hill a little bit from where we were walking, he'd say, there's an, a swale right there, that's the old road, you know, from the 18th century and, and early 19th century. He said, this appears to 1940, you know, probably not 1890 to 1940 road. That's the old road that, the, that all the travelers went on and the explorers. And um, I just told him, you know, that's a gully. That's just an eroded gully. What are you thinking, guy? And, it's, and he said, well, they don't, the gullies don't run along the side of a hill. They run down the hill. You know, the water doesn't run parallel along like that. And I thought, well, you know, you're sort of right. We're just running right down the side of the hill. He said, that's the old road. And they kept moving it uphill. And um, so in the... Uh, you can't really see it on the photos, but 
the, the old road bed's here that I found, and then the gully is parallel and down, about 20 feet down the hill. And this is where we were up on the open ground where I'd found the road, and so this is sort of a trail running parallel. And it's not really eroded, it's just an old wagon rut that has made a depression. And so um, it's hard to tell from the photos, but it's pretty clearly obvious that there was a, a, an older road bed in there. So now Zebulon Pike, getting back to him, that's sort of the exciting part for me too, to, to not only find, you know, surveying this old road and then finding out this National Historic Trail got designated and, and so we got the National Park Service to come look at it and then they find this older section and then we start realizing that Zebulon Pike came through there and put it in his diary. And so um, what this is in, in uh, let's see, 1806, three years after, uh, um, Lewis and Clark, 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. Lewis and Clark set out soon after that, went up the Missouri River up to Oregon. Um, the U.S. Army wanted to go more south than west, and Santa Fe was in Mexico and Spain, and so they sent Zebulon Pike, Army Colonel or Captain, and his crew to go map out through Colorado and, and up right above the top of uh, New Mexico and Arizona, and so. He got arrested in Santa Fe. He'd gone too far south. A lot of issues about if he did that on purpose, if that was his real mission. He got arrested by the Spanish government, 1807, February 1807, and they took his maps away and they treated him nice. But they said, "We got to take you to headquarters down in, in Central Mexico." So they marched him down there for for a month or so. He kept secret diaries and, and mental notes of all that was going on, so it really worked out good for him because he was getting to see a lot more of the country than he would have if he had been sneaking around. He was getting marched right through it and seeing the towns and getting to spend the nights in beds. And so he uh, kept a diary, daily diary, of how far they traveled, what they saw each day. And as soon as he got back, within a year, he published this diary. He actually had it done before Lewis and Clark's diary got published. And it showed all about New Spain. He had been down into Mexico and back up through San Antonio and everywhere. And they had just exiled him back along the OSR, along El Camino Real, right to Louisiana to turn him back out of the country. And, and he kept a daily diary. And so you can buy copies of this. I actually bought one off Amazon. They still, it's in print, but I've um, never seen, you know, it's a, a handwritten version or anything. I don't know how the original type was in 1808, but. Here's, here's just a diary entry. 18th of June is a Thursday. This is 1807. He rode until half past 10 o'clock. We arrived at the River Brazos. Here is a stockade guard with one corporal, six men, a ferry boat, swam our horses over, one drowned, several others all near it, owing to their striking each other's feet. We came on about two miles on this side of a bayou called the Little Brazos, which is only a branch of the other and makes an impassable swamp at certain seasons, distance 31 miles. Then the next day, talks about come on through the prairie. So 18th of June, they crossed at, at 10.30, on the, at 10.30 a.m., April, I mean, June 18th, Thursday, 1807, they crossed the Bradis River. And now this is... Would that be the Highway 21 crossing? This is north of there, uh, up more toward Montford. Okay. And, uh, this was before even Fort Tenochtitlan was established in 1830. I mean, this was before Moses Austin. This was before any Anglo explorers. And it's hard to believe, and I've never really, I, I pointed this out to people, what in the world did they have a Mexican army group there and a ferry boat on the Brazos River in 1807? I mean, that's unbelievable that it was that civilized to actually have a ferry and an army guys at the river, at the El Camino Real crossing. But it shows you how the El Camino Real was really like a highway. I mean, you had a ferry, you had army guys, you had all of this in 1806 right there. And so it was for the Mexican army, for all of the support of the missions, for all of this trail, it was their highway through central Texas. And um, so anyway, he mentions crossing and then, then they stayed the night, 31 miles that day. But he came about two miles across the Brazos and he crossed the Little Brazos. Now, if you go back, to my map here, uh, we're talking, OSR is here. The Brazos River crossing is, um, is, here's the Brazos over here. Now, if you go two miles up, you cross the Little Brazos, which is still there. It's still, uh, it's considered a small river of Texas. And it's still called the Little Brazos. Uh, it surprised me that he used that name. 
uh, and the first hill, our, our swales are right here on the bluff. This whole land is like the first uphill land above the Little Brazos if you're traveling up. And so he obviously camped really right near the top of the hill above the Little Brazos River, which turns out to be, you know, exactly where we have this piece of road left called Rye Loop Swales. We've got the little road section still preserved down there. We've got the 1940 road bed right here. We've got 200, yard, 200 feet over here is highway paved, so it's just the perfect place for a roadside park for signs to see the whole Brazos River bottom. And we have Zebulon Pike's diary that he spent the night there, June 18th, 1807. Yes? Why do you have two spellings in that diary? See, at the river yeah, I don't know. Like, like I say, I don't know what the original was written. I'm sure when it was published, it was printed. It's set type. You know, this is actually a typewriter transcription. So I don't really, I haven't seen the original set type version from 1808 uh, to see how they spelled uh, things. But spelling, you know, especially names, was very low on the priority of, of people. Uh, maps, everything, you'll see it written all all different kinds of things and a lot of it was because they weren't sure and so they might have purposely done it twice so they'd think well we got it right one time you know we just we don't want to stick with with one spelling because we may be wrong twice so they'll spell it both ways um, but then here in early 2017 this year TxDOT finally put up the signs that the National Park Service has paid for and, and we worked uh, through the El Camino Real Association to get these um, created it looks small when you see them up on that pole, but actually that's a four foot tall sign and three foot wide, and uh, you know it's this high. It looks small when you pass it. Now I've that's got. The thing is, I go up and down that road all the time because yeah. I live on one side, both sides of the road. Yeah, right here. And we're. Put that in, I, I went, Where did they put that? Yeah, they put them. Know, yeah. They've just they put them in at every. We try to get them every so many miles, and TxDOT really tries to limit the number of signs they put in their right of ways because it's another maintenance issue. It's a liability if a car hits it. They put those special expensive breakaway bases so it won't hurt a car too bad if you hit one. But it also is a th another thing to mow around, you know, another guy's got to walk to it with a weed eater when they mow and all of that. So they only allowed us to, to put them wherever there's an intersection of another farm to market road or something. So uh, this one is right in front of Colin Mancuso's driveway. If you come in, if you come in on 2223 from Tabor uh, uh, Road area and you turn to the right, head toward Normandy, you'll see that one right there. But they're all along, back to the Brazos River, back up to the Navasota. And the, and the north side of the road is, is Robertson County in this area, so there, there's road signs going the other way on that road too. But uh, we finally got those up. I mean, it's not the end at all. The roadside park is really something I'm going to keep working on. And, and uh, David Coleman with the City of Costa State Water Department is really receptive. I need to just sit down and talk with him to get some kind of paperwork going with the city and the, and the El Camino Real Association to, to start working it. If we can get some kind of an agreement to have a permanent uh, use of that land for a roadside park, then we can probably get National Park Service to start funding some. We've actually used uh, what they call crowdfunding, uh, these accounts where you, on the internet you can just plea, you know, that you're, you're a, you have a need, a public use need, and, uh, and, and we did that over in East Texas, and we needed $4,000 to buy a four acre piece of land at a, at a tax sale that had seven of these swales in one little area, a very historic spot in East Texas called the Lobanil Cuts. And it was going up for a tax auction. It was unusable land the family had inherited, quit paying taxes. So we needed 4000 and the El Camino Real Association put out a GoFundMe account or whatever on the internet. You put a little video and you say why you're needing to raise money, please donate, you know. We'll give you a cap or a pen or a sticker or something if you give us some money. We got $28,000 in about a month from people all over the place. And uh, and so we got the thing at the tax sale. Luckily, we talked to the only other interested buyer who wanted for timber to clear it and told him that, you know, we really want to preserve it. We don't want dozers in there. And he said, okay, I won't bid on it. To, you know, it's not even $2,000 worth of trees on it. So he didn't bid and we got it for the $4,000 taxes owed. Now we're working with uh, National Park Service to put in a little parking lot to develop it with some trails and signs so you can walk through the trails and see them. 
and uh, then we'll probably donate it to the Texas Historic Commission. Once it's developed, they'll take it as part of their trail si uh, park system and stuff. But uh, thank y'all, and any questions? Mm -hmm.